inspired by Paris, I abandoned my philosophy talk and have decided instead to read you three original short stories. The first story uh, is inspired by a paper of David Christensen's, and the title of the story is Rationality Requires Incoherence. Oh, I'm going to be drawing on the board a lot, and my handwriting is not great. So if you're in the back, you may want to consider moving forward. Uh, please don't worry about disturbing anyone. But it will be difficult for people to read what's on the board if, if you're far away. One day, Joe woke up. He opened his door, and outside were a thousand logicians. Uh, they were all screaming sincerely one thing. Uh, and the thing was a complicated logical falsehood, which I'll abbreviate here as R and not R. Joe trusted these logicians and so responded, maybe so. And so Joe came to have some positive credence that the claim the logicians were yelling was true. And so Joe became incoherent, since it's incoherent to put any credence in a logical falsehood. Joe was reasonable in doing this. The end. Moral. Rationality sometimes requires you to be incoherent. Next story. This story is called uh, Incoherence Can Be Understood as Fragmentation. And it's based on joint work with Agustin Rea from MIT. In the previous story, I said that Joe started believing a logical falsehood to some positive degree. But this is puzzling. It's not obvious how to believe a logical falsehood. Imagine that you're a computer programmer, a robot programmer, and your job is to program a robot to believe that it's raining while also believing that it's not raining. How do you program it? Well, certainly you have the robot say things like, it's raining and it's not raining. And certainly if someone, and you program the robot so that if someone asks it, is it both raining and not raining? The robot answers yes. But what do you tell the robot to do when it's deciding whether to bring its umbrella outside? What's the choice of boots that you make when you believe that it's both raining and that it's not raining? It's a little puzzling. 
So it's not obvious what it is to believe a logical falsehood. It's not obvious how you have to be in order to be incoherent. That's what the next story is about. The story is a comedy. Frank is distraught. He's frantically looking around for something he lost in his basement. It's dark in his basement, so he's using his flashlight to, to shine the light around. Uh, Frank's wife calls down to the basement. Honey, what are you looking for? Uh, and Frank answers, my flashlight. That, that was the comedy part of the story. <laughs> now, before Frank realizes what's going on, did he believe that he had his flashlight in his hand? Well, yes and no. In some respects, he believed that he did have his flashlight in his hand. For example, for the purposes of choosing how to move his arm, he believed that he had a flashlight in his hand. After all, he was moving his arm around in a way that only makes sense if you have a flashlight in your hand to shine on things. But other aspects of his dispositions only make sense if he didn't believe he had his flashlight in his hand, because he had no reason to be down in his basement searching for anything if he already had his flashlight. So Frank's belief state is divided or fragmented. And I propose that we can understand incoherent states of mind as fragmented states of mind. So here is an answer to the question of what it takes to put some credence in a logical falsehood, or what it takes to believe a logical falsehood, such as that it's raining or, and that it's not raining. What it takes to believe that it's raining and it's not raining is to be confused about whether it's raining. It's to be of two minds about whether it's raining. It's to be, it's to, in some respects, believe that it's raining, and in other respects, believe that it's not raining. Just as Frank, in some respects, I'm gonna draw Frank's head here. Just as in Frank, just as Frank, in some respects, believes that he has his flashlight in his hand, but in other respects, believes that he doesn't. Here's a picture of uh, what's going on in Frank's head. Uh, Frank has, uh, there's a part of him, or a fragment, that believes, I have lost something. Find it with flashlight. And there's another part of him that believes my flashlight is in my hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I have lost something, find it. This is the fragment that uh, doesn't realize that um, I have lost, uh, ah, sorry. I have lost my flashlight. Find it. And then this is the fragment that doesn't realize he has the flashlight in his hand. There's another fragment that realizes that he has the flashlight in his hand 
um, and just believes that he's lost something and he's going to use the flashlight to find that thing. Okay, these fragments conflict and the proposal from this story is that we should understand incoherent belief as fragmentation. Chapter two, Frank has a wife who's a philosopher. Here's a picture of her head. She encountered a strange scenario the other day. She was looking at a clock and the clock said three o'clock. She, on that basis, came to believe that it was three o'clock, and justifiably so. In fact, she was right. She looked at the clock exactly at three o'clock. But later she realized that the clock was stopped, and it was just an accident that she learned the correct time. She noted in passing that she was justified in her belief and that it was true, but that she didn't then know that it was three o'clock. She forgot about this realization, but there was a part of her that, if asked about that situation directly, would have been disposed to respond in that situation, which I'll call S, I had justified true belief that it was three o'clock, but did not know that it was three o'clock. Susan is an epistemologist, and she also has general views about epistemology. If you had at any time asked her, what is knowledge? she would have answered, knowledge is justified true belief. Susan's state of mind is initially fragmented. For the purposes of directly answering questions about situation S, she believes that she had justified true belief, but not knowledge in situation S, and therefore, by the way, knowledge is not equal to justified true belief. But there was a more general fragment, which, I'm uh, sorry, there was a part of her responsible for answering general questions about epistemology that was committed to knowledge being justified true belief, and hence, indirectly, committed to a contrary verdict about this situation. Notice that in these cases of fragmentation, we think of a person as being jointly controlled by their fragments. In this case, Frank and the flashlight, his fine hand motions are controlled by the fragment that believes that he has a flashlight in his hand. There are his hands. But his more global motion, his decision to be downstairs in the basement searching for anything at all, is controlled by this fragment, according to which he's lost his flashlight. Search for it. I'll indicate that this fragment controls Frank's feet The same is true for his wife, the epistemologist. In response to certain sorts of queries, certain sorts of questions, this fragment controls the show. But in response to other questions, she is disposed to be controlled by this fragment. Chapter three, it's called The Epistemologist's Friend. Ah, I'm sorry, we're on to uh, the end.
story two. Uh, we're on to story three called uh, Fragmentation uh, Illuminates Disagreement. Susan has an epistemologist friend. And the friend displays for her an argument. Uh, the argument that has its first premise in S. Susan has no knowledge. Second premise, in S, Susan has justified true belief. Uh, conclusion, knowledge is not the same as justified true belief. The friend displays this argument to Susan in order to get her to resolve the latent incoherence in her beliefs in one way. I think that thinking about people's mental states as fragmented helps us understand what, what otherwise might be mysterious, namely why and when arguments are helpful in advancing a dispute. In this case, let's suppose that when Susan sees the argument, she resolves the, she notices as a result of the argument the tension between these two parts of herself and resolves the tension in favor, oh, pardon me, wrong person. Uh, she resolves the tension, uh, it's confusing. She resolves the tension uh, in, favor of, uh, in favor of this fragment and so stops in any sense or relative to any conditions believing that knowledge is justified true belief. It could have gone the other way. Sometimes when presented with a purported counterexample, one sticks with one's general theory and instead changes one's dispositions regarding the particular case. Okay, so this is the first um, way in which I think thinking of belief states as fragmented helps us understand disagreement. Namely, it un helps us understand the role that presenting valid arguments um, has in helping people persuade each other. There's another advantage of um, thinking about disagreement in the context of fragmentation it makes it sensible, uh, it makes it understandable why we should be more persuaded, be more moved by disagreement from people who share many of our beliefs near to the disputed matter. So suppose two people are arguing about vegetarianism. Um, Suppose you're arguing with your friend about vegetarianism. One of your friends shares many of your background beliefs that are relevant to whether vegetarianism is true. For example, they um, are committed to similar principles of um, equal treatment. Uh, they have similar beliefs about whether animals feel pain and so on. If you find out that such a friend has come to the opposite conclusion than you, regarding um, whether vegetarianism is morally required, that should move you a lot. On the other hand, suppose you have a different friend who has quite different beliefs about issues surrounding vegetarianism. Maybe they think uh, animals are just little robots uh, and have a um, 
belief that humans have a lot of special rights because uh, God put them on the earth, for example. Uh, then such a person should be less persuasive to you. This makes sense. Well, the, the fragmentation model is one way of making sense of this because when a friend who shares much of, uh, so because, consider your beliefs on the disputed issue. Um, you have various background principles that you believe that may be relevant to the disputed issue. But you realize that you're imperfect at detecting tensions between views on the disputed issue and your background principles. So that when someone else who shares a lot of the background principles comes to a different conclusion, that is some evidence that your conclusion is incompatible with those background beliefs. And so, put some rational pressure on you to change your view on the disputed issue. On the other hand, suppose that a friend, that your other friend has very different background beliefs. In that case, finding out that their view on vegetarianism is very different than yours has almost no evidential effect on, it gives you no, almost no reason to believe that your view on vegetarianism is in tension with your own background principles and so has less tendency to make you change your beliefs. Ah, good. We have time for another uh, advantage of the fragmentation picture. Let me conclude with this. Quine famously talked about the web of belief. The picture was that all of your beliefs can be thought of as a giant web. And what changes them is sense experience. But it's been famously attributed to Quine that none of these beliefs, none of what you hold, is completely immune to revision. Discussion from yesterday in the conference shows that there's a problem with that thought. The problem is, what about the rules that specify how it is that changing part of the web changes other parts? There's a dilemma for Quine. On the one hand, if those rules are beyond revision, then there's something that's beyond revision after all. On the other hand, if those rules themselves are subject to revision, if the rules on how to revise are themselves subject to revision, then the rules themselves are inconsistent. Because no consistent system of inductive rules specifies that it should ever be rejected in favor of one of its rivals. So we have a problem. But the first story offers us a satisfying response. Since rationality requires incoherence anyway, and since, as the second story teaches us, we can think of incoherence as fragmentation, rationality requires fragmentation. And so the way is open to think that one's web of belief may not 
all be committed to the same rules of revision. The web itself might be incoherent. And if the web is incoherent, it's compatible, it's possible that every piece in it, absolutely every piece, is subject to revision. So we pay a price to be, um, to be incoherent, uh, but we also gain a great benefit. Namely, it opens the way to have every piece of one's beliefs be subject to argument. And indeed, thinking of beliefs as fragmentation can make coherence look bad because a completely coherent believer would never be moved purely by an argument because, I claim, arguments only get their purchase, their persuasive force on a listener by way of lost my argument here. Sorry. Ah, there it is. Arguments only get their persuasive force on a listener by way of taking advantage of a hidden incoherence in the listener's belief state. So we lose something perhaps by being incoherent, but we gain non-dogmatism. Moral. The best way to understand disagreement among different people is to understand disagreement within yourself. Thanks. <laughs>